Well, good morning. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles with me, if you would, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. <clears throat> While you're turning there, let me just take a moment to thank you on behalf of my wife and I for your prayers and your support and your love all through my back surgery last December and through the recovery. And as you can see, I'm not preaching in a stool. I'm not sitting down. I'm on my own two feet and God marvelously intervened. So many people around the country praying and you were part of it and I just wanna thank you for it. It's good to be back. It's good to be here face to face. The only Zoom I want to hear is the jet when I fly to the Bahamas. I've had enough of it. There's nothing like face-to-face -face fellowship. Just my personal, my personal um, preference. Now, we're going to do a little bit of um, roundabout introduction this morning to the book of uh, Ephesians, and the direction for that study was led to by a man that I am close to in Danville, and he asked me over a table having for some lunch together, and he said, why are the assemblies not doing well? Why are local churches not doing well? And it led me to think about that question. Number one, how do you measure spiritual things? I, I can measure this podium because I can take a tape measure or a yardstick and I can measure it. But how do you measure spiritual things? Is it by the number of people? Is there but the size of the building? And that got me to think. And then I thought, well, what is what is the goal of the church? And it led me to about a dozen questions over the last year. People have asked me, why does God save us? He doesn't just take us to glory. Well, what is the purpose of the local church? Is it to get rid of social ill? What is the, and I went down and I wrote all these questions and I thought there's only going to be one place I can find this. And there are two books in the New Testament that deal with the doctrine of the church. The book of Acts is the historical record. And I didn't want to look at that because Acts also has a, a speed bump in it that if you don't realize is there, you're going to get derailed. And that is that it's also a transitional book from the law on the day of Pentecost till Paul would come later towards the end of the book and receive the actual doctrines of the church as Paul was given that dispensation. So there are transitional truths that might not, that were there in the early chapters of Acts that might not apply today. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to get into the history of all this stuff. I want to know what is God's mind and will and what is the doctrine? So I thought Ephesians is where I'm going to go. And I'm thankful that the Lord led me there because it answered a lot of questions that people have asked me that I didn't really know how to answer intelligently. Now, we went to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 because there's a verse here that's going to be my intro verse. The verse that I'm going to use to give you the motive for my speaking on this portion. All right. I am not speaking on, on Ephesians because I know it better than you do. I'm not speaking it on Ephesians because I've been saved since 1972, and that's more than some of you are in age. Um, I, I'm not speaking on this to be judgmental and stand up here and say, now I know this and you're not living it. That is far from it. I am ministering in, on it because, are you ready? You, this is unbrower like but I'm going to do it anyway. It's my new word for the last year. I'm doing it because I love you. Yeah, I said it. I'm a man, and I love you. And if I don't minister the word of God because I love you and want the best for you, then I need to sit down and keep my mouth quiet. 
I'm not here to impress you. I'm not here to judge you. But the word of God can do both of those things. And that's what I trust will happen. Now, let's look at this wonderful verse that we have here. And let me just give you the introduction of that verse. And then we'll go to Ephesians and we'll start our movement through. Verse 7. I have seen servants or slaves upon horses. And I have seen princes walking as servants slash slaves on the earth. Now, that is one of the verses like Solomon would give you, for instance, a tree who falls and lays to the north, and there it lays. Duh. Now give us a half hour sermon on that, Mario, and let's see what you got. This verse isn't that difficult. Are you ready? Only princes and royalty rode on horses at that time. It was a symbol and slaves walked behind them, right? And Solomon is saying, I've seen people who should be princes walking as slaves. And I've seen slaves who should be, who should be walking, riding as princes on the horse. You know what he's saying? Are you living up? To what God expects you to be. You got it? Are you all you can be in Christ? Are you living and reigning as Romans says in righteousness by Jesus Christ? And as I study the book of Ephesians. I had to many times bow my head or bow my knees at my couch. And say oh God please forgive me. Because I am mudding around ankle deep in water and think I'm doing great things. Please forgive me. And then I started to feel convicted, especially as going through this surgery, that this could have been the end of my path. My words to my wife when I woke up in recovery were, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And I started to think, you know, I need to make the most of my time. I need. Until the Lord calls me home, until I finish my course, I need to be what God wants me to do. If it's a prince, I need to be riding on a horse. If it's a servant, I need to be walking behind him. Whatever it is, I ask you to think right now. Don't think about me. That's my job. Think of this. Are you in your walk with the Lord? Being and doing. All that he wants you to be and do. Please think about that. Because if I minister this word. And you don't walk away here. Realizing that. Then I failed. I've entertained you. I've kept you mentally busy. For 45 minutes. And that's not my purpose. My purpose is to evoke into you. By the spirit's enablement. Using the word. The reality of your walk with the Lord. Do you understand that? Remember that word. Walk. Walk. With the Lord. Because I care about you. Now. Ephesians. If you would please. Chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, I'm not, I don't even intend because of the lack of time and trying to compress everything um, uh, to accomplish what you might think I'm going to accomplish this morning in an introduction. But uh, tonight we will hit in it, into it a little bit better. And then Wednesday we'll into it better. And then next Sunday we'll be full throttle. And hopefully you'll be able to look back then and say, oh, it was profitable that you and Betty came. <laughs> Because it, you're going to wonder where we're going as we start to move through here. But the reality of your walk with the Lord. Do you realize? Do you realize the great transaction, the great change that took place in your life when you got saved? Now, when I got saved down in. Kendall on a telephone pole, good 25 feet up off the ground, 
All I knew was Jesus saved me. <laughs> All I knew is I was forgiven. My dad asked, well, what, what are you? What kind of Christian are you? I said, I'm just a forgiven man. I'm just saved. That's all I have. Listen, in his commentary, Lewis Sperry Schaefer, in his systematic theology, has, has a whole volume, I believe it is, on 33 miracles that took place the day you got saved. And the question is, do you, if you don't realize God's intent for you on this earth, you will never live up to it because ignorance is not bliss for a Christian. Now, my barber is a Christian, and he was raised in a Christian home, and he even preaches, and he's a good man, and he, I enjoy getting my hair cut, and we talk. I just try not to get him too excited. Because he can go wild while he's cutting your hair if he gets excited. You just got to keep him calm. But he said to me, I don't believe a real Christian can ever be uh, deceived. I said, whoa, hold on now. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. I think we need to be careful. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Ignorance for the Christian is not bliss. So when somebody comes to me and says, what is the purpose of the church in the world today? I better have an answer and you better have an answer because if they go, Barna goes out and he asks questions to high school I mean, or college kids, they're going to say, it's a political group of conservatives who are trying to push through a morality designated to them. That's what one of my old girlfriends from high school posted on hers indirectly to get to me. That's easy to do. Just unfriend me. I don't care because you're not going to make me change my faith. I mean, I, I am truly a converted person. I know what I was before and I know what I am now. And I really think I might know a little bit, but not everything about what's going to take place in glory with me. I know it's beyond my human understanding, but that's another point. But, but here's the point. What is God's plan? I'm going to give you the Barnes note answer this morning so when you leave you'll know are you ready ephesians chapter three are you still with me this guy shouts i before i get up i have ever since i started speaking again in january i've always said lord calm me down don't let me get excited because when i do and i start doing this people think oh, he's yelling at me you know, and I don't want that. I just want to be Warren Wearsby like, you know, like a grandpa, like a grandpa. Verse 21, are you ready? Unto him. Who is the him? Well, in the context, verse 19 says, the fullness of God. Now, unto him who is able, it's God the Father. Can we agree on that? I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach it. I'm going to make you think this morning. Okay. Now watch onto him. That is God. Now the King James has an italicized word. I don't know what, if you have the NAS or if you have NIV or whatever, it, it might not be there, but it says unto him, B is in italics, which means in the original language, the Greek it's not there. The stress is this, unto God, glory. Not should be, not can be, but glory. You get it? Now watch. By the church. Mm -mm. Because of the church. Mm -mm. Produced by the church. Mm -mm. Locative, E-N in the Greek, in its location. We have, watch this now, we have this treasure, this excellency, this glory, Paul said, in an earthen vessel. To God be glory in the church. We are the vessel who is going to display to the world the glory of God. Now watch. How does that happen? By means of Christ Jesus. Now, right now, you should be smiling and saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
You know why? Because it was up to me to have glory to God because it's coming from me. And we would really be in trouble. Right? Now, the, this is like a mathematical equation, like Romans 8, where it talks about him he foreknew, him he did, pre, him he did, him he did, and he gets to glorify. Right? You know that verse? It's just, that's a mathematical. This is what happens to these, to that to these. And we make a big thing about the progress and the order and God is this. When actually all God is saying there is you're secure because the ones who start out are the ones who finish. The equals are all equals. Isn't that great? You don't believe the word of God because right now you'd be swallowed. I have news for you. If you're a Christian today, you're going to make it to glory. So stop moping about the world. Stop complaining about the world. It's the, the world is in your home. Now watch. I'm gonna, I don't want to get sidetracked. Unto God glory in the location of the church, the vessel, by means of Jesus Christ throughout all the ages to come, world without end. Amen. The purpose of the local church, I'll go even deeper. The purpose of you as a believer in the world is to display the glory of God to the world by being a vessel that Jesus Christ can glorify his father in the world because he's not here anymore. You're his body. His spirit dwells in you. Are we glorious? See, that is why chapter one through three, when you read it, the word glory appears, I think, nine times in three chapters. Glory, 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 glory. Uh, question? Can I ask you a question and begin personal with you? As God should do, as he does with me when I study? Am I living up to that? Am I riding the horse as a prince? Or am I walking as a prince? Are people able to see my life when I go out into the world? And we'll talk about how that happens. This isn't some metaphysical thing that happens and People just are aware, oh, I just like being around him. It's just so nice, and there's an air of this, and there's an air of this. No, he is going to tell us how that glory is going to be manifested and produced through us, in us and through us by the Lord Jesus. That's our purpose, beloved. Did you ever feel as a Christian, I don't know, I don't feel too satisfied. I'm not too content. I don't know. I'm saved. I know this. I know that. But, you know, that's the work of the enemy, by the way, to get you to be not content with what God has for you by either not knowing your purpose in the world as a Christian or by not knowing how it's done in your life. So you get frustrated and he gets to work on your mind and we have a problem. But this is God's plan. Beloved, this is God's plan. And we're going to see it unfold like a flower, the more like tonight and Wednesday and Sunday to where when we're done, we can say, wow, this is marvelous. This is wonderful. What shall the person profit if he gained the whole world and in doing so lose his own soul? Right? I mean, I could be elected president of the United States. I wouldn't want to. It's the worst place to sit is in the president's chair. The bigger your chair is when you get promoted in life, the more criticism you get. I don't, you know, I want to be the little guy that work, works as the janitor and no one sees him because he's at night. And I don't want to be, I want to be like the guy that doesn't even leave a footprint. Right? Anyway, so this is God's plan. Now, what I'd like to do with you now in the time we have remaining as I want to talk to you a little bit, it's going to seem random, but just bear with me. I want to talk to you about the hindrances to that. Okay? Because in the end of the book, in chapter 6, he says, now, put on the armor of God and pray. And he does something else that we don't ever hear talked about, is he starts naming other people's names, and he says, pray one for another and do this. Because you know what? We're all in the same boat, and we need each other. There's no place 
in the Bible for independent believers who are not fellowshipping where the word of God is taught or people fellowship. It, the occupation of God right now is in local gatherings. And I'm not going to say like this. I'm just going to say where believers are gathering together because that's God's universal plan for believers. And he's going to say in chapter four, why? So don't crucify me after this in the back and say, that's quite a statement. Can you back it up? Yes, just read chapter four. He's going to tell you why we need each other. He's going to say why we need to be gathering together. And he's going to say that's where his heart is. That's where Jesus, why Jesus died and gave gifted men and won victories and gave them, gave them uh, fruit of his victory to be used for God's glory. But there's one who opposes, beloved. You can sit here today and just, I could close in prayer now, and you can leave and say, you know, he was speaking to me because I'm not contented, and I'm not being what I should be, and I know I'm not where I should. And beloved, listen, none of us are. You should all feel that way when the word of God's ministered. You should always say, man, I need to get more. Boy, I need to get good. I got to keep moving on. That's the healthy way we grow. But we have one who's an enemy. Who in Isaiah 14 said six times, I will, I will. Guess who wants the glory that's God's? He does. He's a formidable foe. And he opposes. So put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. I had an elder in the meeting in South Florida tell me in 1980 after I spoke on the devil, he confronted me in the back and said, you don't believe in a real personified personal devil, do you? Duh. Oh, he's just an attitude of evil, a mind philosophy. Duh. Jesus didn't say that. When Jesus was tempted, some mind philosophy didn't float into the wilderness and can confront him. Listen, we have someone who doesn't want you to ride the horse because you're a prince. He wants you to walk as a slave. And I see it all the time and I fight against it. And Daniel, I have kids that were in my Bible study and they go to churches that they don't, they don't ever get taught. And so they get on Facebook and they say, we had a great church today. Church broke out and the Holy Spirit was moving. And then Monday morning, oh, the devil's against me. Pray for me because you know what? Blah, blah, blah. And at this blah, blah. And I'm a victim. And Tuesday, I'm a victim. And Wednesday, I'm a victim. You are a victor, not a victim. A matter of fact, you're more than a conqueror, according to Romans. Do you know that? Do you know how? What if somebody comes to you and says, how could you be more than a conqueror? Right? If I, if, 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 if I took Patrick outside and we fought each other and I beat him, which I wouldn't do because I have a bad back. Mama taught me, pick a fight with people you can win. So I'll go in the nursery and pull somebody out I can handle. Now, it, if, I, if I don't understand that the devil is an active resistor to my growth, and, or he doesn't want me to read it, or he doesn't want me to know it, or I don't know what my resources are, then I'm never going to be exactly all that I should be. And I need to understand this. And when that man told me that, I can't believe that, that you believe that. Listen, we have one, beloved. We have somebody who doesn't have your well-being, and he likes to work here. You know, I switched from a, when I finished Ephesians to Romans 8. I would tell you this. Read Romans 8. It's the liberation chapter for the believer. It tells us you're free from four distinct things in life that people are slave to. I'm telling you, it is it was a victorious, and it says we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Now, how do you get to be more than conquerors? I, I had a senior moment there. I, I Patrick's got a look on me, and I forgot what I wanted to say. There you go. Now I'm released. Okay. Now watch. How are we more than conquerors? If I beat him up, I've conquered him. How could I be more than conquerors? The same way that sports people pray, Lord, let me win this battle. Oh, to your honor and glory, right? 
So two boxers, Lord, let me beat the snot out of him. Let me bust his nose. But to your honor and glory, Lord. Lord, we are more than conquerors. Listen, because in our freedom to be all that God wants us to be, we win victories to conquer. And watch this now. Added to it is to the glory of God. That's more than conqueror. People can win victories in their life, and it's not for the glory of God. So they can't be more than conquerors. Do you get it? So we want to walk in life redeeming the opportunities to God's glory, to making sure God's glorified. Lord, what would you have me to do today? I haven't intended to speak on this, but it fits, the, it fits it perfectly. Going through all of this and then going through the back surgery. Um, Betty, close your ears. She's heard this five times probably in the last two months. I had a test. I had a test. I always go to the hospital and I know I'm going because God wants me to talk to somebody. Now I preface by saying, you know me well. I spent 25 years in a predominantly poor black school, my wife and I, in Bible studies and helping them get to college and getting them a good future. But anyway, I had a nurse assigned to me 12 hours, 12 hours, 12 hours for five days. Always, not like a regular hospital. I was in the spinal hospital in Duke with a spinal specialist. And the guy in the room, we had a room all alone. And the guy in the room next to me, he had a nurse and I had a nurse. And they reported to these windows so that the head nurse could see what's going on. The second night, they would wake me up when the shift changed at midnight, and I'd have to take a pill at two in the morning. You say, that's rude. No, I couldn't sleep without it. I'd go two hours and pill, two hours and pill, two hours. And, and that night when I got awakened, I was awakened by a really nice, soft, feminine voice. And when I looked up, it was dark except for a bathroom nightlight. And I could see this thin, attractive black person in a nurse's outfit talking to me. But I couldn't tell it was a man or a woman. So I didn't know because I had to fill out a form that said, what is your title? What would you like to be called? What was your sex at birth? What is your sex now? Okay. And I didn't want to offend that person. So very kind, came around, lifted me up, grabbed me by the back, took me in. Best nurse I had my five days there. Loved him. Come back, lay down. In the morning, I got a new nurse. The head nurse comes in to check on me. I said, that person last night in the night shift, man or a woman, how do I address? I don't want to be offensive. Why, you didn't like him? I said, I didn't say that. He's the best nurse I've had in two, in two days. I said, I don't want to offend him. Is it a man or a woman? His name's Elijah. Oh, might have had a Christian mother. And so I said, okay. I said, she said, I had to ask him his first day months ago. How do I address you? Well, what won't be offensive? And he said, Honey, I'm a hundred percent man, but I was raised by a woman and I like pretty things, which meant he was just a feminine, but he was a man. He had relationships with women. So anyway, I said, thank you very much. Two days later, the fourth night, he comes in. Now, some of you know me, but you didn't know me when I got saved. I was a Marine. I was a college athlete and I drank beer. No room for anything that wasn't a male, male and drank beer and cursed. That's just the way it was. So I find it highly offensive. And so I'm laying there and I said, Lord, you spoke to me when I was without Christ. 
I know you want me to speak to Elijah. That's why you brought him here. I knew it. His, his witness bore witness to mine. I just knew it. And I said, give me clarity and let me honor you. And that night, I heard Mr. Brown, you have to get up and get a pill. I said, thank you, Elijah. Picked me up, walked me in, came out. And I knew next day I was going home, fifth day. I said, Elijah, I said, you probably were teased in high school, weren't you? He said, yes, sir. I said, wrongfully, probably, right? He said, yes, sir. I said, I want to tell you something because I probably won't see you. I said, Elijah, don't listen to what the news says about Christians. Don't listen to what the world says about Christians. We call, we're called homophobic and effeminine phobic, and we're called all kinds of things. I want you to know something. Read the Bible yourself. Read it for yourself. I said, God didn't send his world and to condemn the world, but that the world through him might live. God loves you, Elijah. And when I looked up at him in the, in the light, were tears just flowing down his face. And I knew we made a connection. And I said, thank you, Lord, for letting me do that for you. And I said, Elijah, <clears throat> do you know what your name means? He said, no. I said, El is the short for Elohim, the powerful God. In the beginning, God created Elohim, El is the contraction of it it's the short i said a jaw is short for jehovah when somebody says elijah they're saying the god who's powerful and keeps his promise he looked at me he said thank you i needed to hear that and that's was our last words i tell you that because god got glory not because of what i did but i got to glorify god and I was tested to see if I would. Are you tested daily to see if you'll reveal? To glorify God means to make him known, to make him seen, to make him understood, to present him. That's, that's our goal and purpose. If it means taking care of somebody's home mortgage, if it means a kind word, if it means if whatever way we do it that God gives us, but are we doing it? To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all the ages. And the devil says, we'll see about that. Now look at chapter two for a minute. We'll, we're just going to hit now. We have 15 minutes left. And I want to just hit some things about the enemy. Are you ready? Chapter two. And you have the quickened who were dead in trespass and sins. Now in chapter two, now he's going to talk about how did God make a body for the Lord Jesus? He must have had some really good raw materials, right? Wrong. <laughs> he used refuse and he made the greatest, greatest um, creation that he could. You know, the great thing about, about the work of the Holy Spirit, the incarnation of Christ and the duplication of Christ in you. Isn't that marvelous? Okay. Wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, this age. Notice the word walked. You walked around. Listen, and the first enemy to you walking to the glory of God was you did it to the course of this world. Now, the word world is the world cosmos. It means the world order, where, order where we get cosmetics from. And believe it or not, course is the word ion, which means you walked according to the age and the world. What was the in thing, right? What was the, the world has its way of telling you what is the in thing. And the in thing is what you've got to do. And so guess what? Uh, I got I to gotta display this. It's got to be the in thing. I mean, I have to be, I have to be up here rude. So the world says, I'll pick something when I'm violated. I got a tattoo on my arm. Most of you know it. It says, I love Betty to the moon and back. No, it doesn't. Anyway, I have one on my arm. But the world says, you got to have a tattoo. So what do we do? Now I'm not here to preach against that. The world says you have to have a Tesla. 
I got the world says you got to smoke Marlboro on a horse and man, you'll be the guy. Coke says, you know what? You got to drink Coke and then you'll add life. The world, listen, it has a course to it. Beloved, when you got saved, God says, you're done with that. You're done with that world system, the course of the world. First John 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That's all it is out there. And it's passing away, verse 17 says. So why would we put our stock into it? We put our stock into eternity, into the glory of God and revealing him. So somebody says, Mr. Brower, why don't you have this? Because I want to glorify God instead. Oh. Why don't you do this? Because it would hinder my glorifying God. Do you see what I'm saying? And the world says this. So Romans 12 says, be not conformed to this world. Don't give in to what it's telling you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so we say okay world i'm going to do what god wants i'm not going to let you touch my mind now in romans 8 there are four things we are told we have to submit to god are you ready i'm just going to tell you this quickly we can do a little of this when we have quiet time together maybe tonight in verses 5 through 9, we, we are told the first thing is the mind. Our mind is after the spirit. It was after the flesh. So when you get up in the morning, the first thing you should do is say, is, Lord, my mind is yours. Use it. Now, let me ask you this. How do you know what's going on? Let me ask you a question. Answer it in your own mind. What do you think about when you're not thinking? Right? I'll tell you in October, normally with me is deer hunting surround us. Right? Golf is coming now. The heat are playing tonight. The thing, see, that's all things that are coming in and making us. And now I brought tears to, to everyone's eyes because they lost last night. But anyway, the second thing he says in verse 13 is our body. If we're saved, Listen to what the Bible says. If, the, if we're saved, the body is a te the temple of God, a tool for God, a treasury of God's glory, and a testing ground for God to test you. The third thing in Romans 8, 14 is this, the will. So we are led by God. And in that word is this, we're willing to be led. We follow. Come on, son. If I have to tell you one more time, no. That's what we do with our children because they're not willing. But listen, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, you have to give, you have to get up in the morning and say, Lord, my mind is yours. I don't want it to be conformed. My body is yours, Romans 12. My will is yours, not my will, but thy will be done. And then Romans 8, 15 through 17, when he talks about the Spirit cries, Abba, Father, that's our heart, our affection. Do you know those are the four areas what the devil attacks in your life? Here's one for you. How, how, how can I get all this in but finished? There, there are four people in the Old Testament that have face to face encounter with the devil. The first one was Eve. What did he attack there? The next one, as we move through from Eve, is Job. What did he attack in Job? The body. And then what we find is David. And, and David, two times David sinned. I'm going to put this piece of paper away. I'm never, I'll have to do this later. Because this is too important. There are two times David sinned. And he always maintained and God kept him a, a man after God's own heart. You know why? Because unlike Saul... When David was confronted, he eventually would always repent, confess it, and learn, and move on. The first time David sinned is in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, stop. I'm not saying I knew every time David sinned. I'm saying the first time that David had a gross sin, and it affected people in the nation, the first one was with Bathsheba. 
How many people died when he committed a act of fleshly sin? There are sins of the flesh and sins of the, starts with S and rhymes with spit. Spirit. He had a sin of the flesh. Four people died. Uriah, the child, and his two brothers as a result of that. Amnon and Absalom. Okay. But watch God's grace now, because I know God's thinking, you know what? Does that mean I'm out? No. Because from that relationship between Bathsheba and David came. Thank you. Isn't that wonderful? Where sin abounded, grace is as always about. Don't come to me and say, I heard 35 years ago you fell into a gross sin. I did, and I'm not going to talk about it. You know why? Because it's done. And through that, although I'd never want to go through that again, guess what? Blessing came out. And that's the way God works. Don't use your sin as a failure to repent and confess and get back on the horse and ride like a prince. You get it? That's our theme. So then years later, David gets this provoked, and I'm not going to get into this for the sake of time, to number the people. I need to know the number of my people. I need to know how many people my troops are. He, all he has to do today is pick up Time Magazine because once a year they put in China has this many people and, you know, America has this many soldiers and blah, blah, blah. And what we find is this. God gives him nine months to repent. Oh, God's a gracious God and he gives time, but time has an end for him. And he comes back to David and he says through the prophet you better tell David he's sinned and David says this I have sinned greatly didn't say that with Bathsheba he said I have sinned but now he says I've sinned greatly because he's grown in the Lord he knew the, the the effects of his sin and he said man I've really I've, I've sinned greatly so God says you choose what you want you got this this and this he says to the prophet Tell God, I'll go into God's hands because I'd rather be in God's hands than man's. And God sent pest pestilence. How many people died because of his sin of the spirit? 70,000. Oh, God's done with him. Nope. God said, you go to Aranon and you buy a piece of property there and build an altar and sacrifice there. And he did. Do you know what Solomon did on that piece of property? Built the temple. <laughs> Where sin abounded, God, grace over, always over abounds when it's confessed, forsaken, and you get back on the horse. Isn't that good? No, because you're all holy and you're there. I, it must be because you're just. Listen. It's an amazement to me. The devil comes along, and every time he tries to do something with the Lord's people, the Lord intervenes. So watch the course of this world, the prince and the power of this air, and the strong lusts and desires of his flesh. Now, what did the devil attack in David? He got David. He was attacking his will because he got David to do something outside of the will of God. God didn't will him and tell him to go do it. He did it without God's will. It's my will that you do this. I don't care about God. God says, let's see, 70,000 people died. Listen, you be careful about your sin. You be careful about your rebellion. You be careful about your will because it can cause a lot of damage to a lot of people. I know I have done that in my 50 or 60 years as a Christian. I'll tell you that 50 years as a Christian. But wait a second, there's a fourth person who saw the devil face by face. And you know who that is? In the Old Testament, Joshua the high priest in Zechariah chapter 3. And there he's the accuser of the brethren, as it says in Revelation chapter 12. And he's there day and night, and he's pointing the finger. And he looks down and he says, how can that guy be the high priest when his, his garments are filthy and he's soiled and he's unclean? And God says, go down and change his clothes. He doesn't say wash his clothes, make him wash his own clothes. He didn't say you made your bed, now lie in it. He changed him. 
That's the grace of God. And in Ephesians, what we're going to see is the book breaks into two halves. Chapter 1, 2, and 3, and then chapter 4, 5, and 6. Chapter 1, 2, and 3 is the doctrinal portion, the actual teaching. This is my teaching. And there are times in that portion where God tell, uses the Holy Spirit and teaches what does the Spirit do for us. And then in 4, 5, and 6, to balance that out, he gives what do we do in response to what the Holy Spirit is doing? Do you understand? And I, am, I will make mention to you that I believe that the biggest need for us in the local church is to get back to the doctrine, the teaching, and the work of the Holy Spirit and why he is with us. Because some of us sit around and the Spirit is just there saying, let's do something. I want to do something. We don't understand who he is, how he operates how he desires to go on, and what he'll do for you. Beloved, he wants you to ride on the horse with royalty in your head up and be a victor in life by thanks be unto God who always leadeth us in victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's going to get us to walk in this world so that we can walk worthy of the vocation. We can walk not as other Gentiles in the emptiness of our mind like we did, so that we can walk in love. We can walk in light. We can walk filled with the Spirit. And when those things are happening, God can do amazing things, abundantly above all we can ask or think. And it happens. But we have to get out of our comfort zone. We got to get out of our selfish zone. We got to get, listen, we have got to learn that we have got to die daily. The Apostle Paul said, we die every day for you, and you make fun of us, but that's okay. Would that I was like the Apostle Paul. My friends, you're here this morning. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're in, this, you're, you're in, you're in the rapids without a canoe. You have, no, you have no help, and you will never be satisfied and content because God made man to know him and glorify him. And listen, God, according to Ephesians 1, is gathering all together that in the fullness of time, all must be gathered into one that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will be all in all. He does it by the gospel and salvation, by the gospel and rejection, because these will be lorded over and these are willingly bowing the knee. In the coming time, when the clock click, clicks its last second, everybody takes their place and time will be no more. And it's set in eternal stone. And the decision is yours. Where will you stay? Where will you spend? Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts. Father, our hearts have a hard time using our lips to express what we think and what we feel. But we're thankful that you know the heart. Man looks on the inside, but God looketh upon the heart. Sometimes we feel like Peter, who living loveless in the world, would say to Lord, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Father, Help us, Lord, to get our ship straight, our rudder straight. May the Spirit fill the wind of our sails. Help us to be victorious in all you have for us as your people. The Lord Jesus made it possible. It is your plan, and the Spirit enables it. And so everything has been ready and made ready for us, but we have to know it. That's the head, the mind. We have to will it. We have to love you. That's the heart. And so, Father, we just bow and say, Lord, help us. Enable us. Open the eyes of our understanding first. And then help us to understand the power that's available to us by your spirit. Father, we thank you. 
And we ask that the glory would be, come to you through your son in us for all the ages to come. 